Hey gang, how's it going? Everyone's excited about the Battle of the Burger stuff next week. I will send you the JPEG on it. Uh, they're giving all the flyers done and everything. So we're going to have a concessions uh, Battle of the Burger. They came up with concession items, different burgers. Nice. I'll send you all the stuff on that. And they have a project on building a West Coast baseball team uh, out and then project on how to do that. Yeah. So that was cool as well. This is Matt Aker. He's from uh, Port Angeles, Port Angeles Lefties owner. Yep. Then you did a lot of different teams here. I own a league here. As well. Kind of give us your biography and everything else. All right. I um, was born on the coast in Aberdeen and moved to here at middle school and went to North Thurston High School, so right down the road. Um, Central Washington University, and I came back because uh, I went there to play football and baseball. And I came back and coached here at St. Martin's for my first two years as a, as an assistant coach, and it was wonderful. I had a great time. I became a college head coach at 24 years old, which made me the youngest college head coach in the country for the first five years of my career. Um, I went backwards and came back to St. Martin's and was the recruit coordinator for the athletic department. For all sports for a couple of years and I did that because I was creating businesses and they were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And one of them was a baseball league here in town it's called the Puget Sound Collegiate League and it was more developmental that's how we funded it rather than like fan based and some of the stuff you're probably doing in like sports marketing and, and what uh, but uh, it, it was a really successful model for us had a good time um, I had to leave that and leave St. Martin's uh, because my business has got so big and so I coached at Timberline High School for two years and it was, it was a great experience and still really had, had really good connections here. Um, lost a couple, uh, you know, good people here too, Father Gerard and Bob Grisham and, and uh, Kate Garland, um, but they were all really, really good and important people in my life. So I've had a lot of time at St. Martin's over the years. Um, when I made the, the Puget Sound Collegiate League, I really enjoyed at the time um, the development and the training, but the business part was actually became like mentally really interesting to me. So I bought a West Coast League team. Um, they have since closed the loophole for somebody like me to actually own a team in the league. So everybody at the table is extremely wealthy, um, and I, I got in through a loophole. So at the time you had to have $3 million in disposable income, which I did not have coming off being a college baseball coach. Um, but there was no requirement to be a minority owner. So I bought 5% of the team. And then um, there was no rules in the bylaws at the time to buy the rest of the team once you were a current owner. So that's what I did. So I, I bought in with 5% and found the loophole. They allowed it and then basically closed the gap and upped uh, the disposable income number considerably. Um, at the time, I was a little insulted. Now that I'm at the table, I totally understand because the strength of the league is extremely, extremely important. Um, I have played in what was this league prior to it becoming the West Coast League. I was here at the inception of the West Coast League when it split from the Pacific International League. I have coached, operated, and owned. Been the janitor and been the CEO. So, and, and still am currently the beer guy because I can't teach anybody how to fix faucets and stuff. It's really not that hard, but for some reason, there's nobody on that in the area up there that knows how to do it. So um, I still jump into K coolers and fix that stuff because that's money as far as I'm concerned. So I want to make sure that stuff's working. Uh, you speak my language, yeah. the CO2, and yeah. being able to hit it. Yeah. I once had it where they switched the lines on me. Oh, yeah. The whole thing, right? It's yeah. just red and white. Yeah. That's all you have to do. Yeah, it's, it's not that complex, but it confuses some folks sometimes. Um, the, the business up there has been uh, booming. It's been a, a success for us. The West Coast League is extremely successful. Um, and then other avenues of revenue have shot off of us starting the team up there. So um, I have a fleet of mobile bars. Um, we can have mobile bars in Washington if you own a sports team, specifically a professional baseball or football team. Soccer, they, don't, they can't do alcohol because... When the Sounders, when they when they came in, they play at Seahawks Stadium, so the Seahawks are actually doing the alcohol for the stadium for the soccer games. So there's no been no lobby for them to have that. So the mobile units have become quite uh, quite a business. that's actually shot off of what we're currently doing. Team store downtown, lots of different stuff, and there's a lot more to it than most people think. So 
So talk about the soft ones. Talk about the merch because that usually gets kind of lost in the shuffle. How important is your merch, not just your brand and your logo, but also being able to move units? Well, that was actually an interesting. That's what I was talking to Bellingham about today. We're talking about video boards and merch. Um, we do we do about two hundred thousand dollars a year on merch, um, which is which is okay. It's actually a lot for a small for a small market. Um, but the name Lefties is is a name that actually kind of transcends just the area. The reason why they're called Lefties is the team actually the town voted on the name Marmot, and the Marmot name is written out, right? And so I got a letter from them saying they're going to sue me if we wrote the name out Marmot and put it on clothing. After talking to attorneys, because the Marmot Clothing Company is an outdoor brand, right? It's a real issue because they're really sold on the Olympic Peninsula quite a bit, and people are going up through the mountains. And I was looking at a potential headache, and I was like, "How much am I? How much? What am I going to have to do here?" And they're like, "I don't know, maybe a hundred grand ish. They might like work with you. They could come back later." And I'm like, yeah, "I don't want to take that chance." And so um, I came up with Port Angeles Upper Left, so the Polys. And they tested it, the John Stanton's group, who owns the Mariners and the Rainiers and two teams in our league. They, te- they run tests, and they were like, ah, that's confusing. Uh, Paul Laws, Port Angeles, Washington, uh, that's confusing. And I got frustrated, and I was like, well, I'll just call them the lefties. What are they going to do? It's like calling your team Saturday. And they came back, and they're like, oh, that test is great. You should totally do that. And that's exactly how it happened. But... When you're going through and you're making merch, um, I have a box in the back room of our team store, um, of, and I leave it in the middle. This is what, actually, we were laughing about this today because Stephanie from the Bells is asking, why do you have that box in the middle of it? It is 400 shirts that I failed on. And I leave it there so people have to walk around it or step over it to remind them, like, take the time to think about it when you do a design. Because I was like, everything I was producing, every shirt, every hat, sold, sold. Sold and I got lazy. I didn't really look at the design. It didn't look very well. It, it just kind of looked crappy, and it didn't sell. So I leave that box there to remind everybody. My current general manager, um, I thought it was pretty smart. She actually did a lesson this last summer where she took about half the shirts because I told her I don't want it gone and started shooting them out of the cannon just to get rid of them. And and actually, but she saved us money because we don't have to use other product to do that. Um, I get a lot of questions all the time about. How can we get some new jerseys? Well, to do a size run of jerseys for a team is like really hard for fans because maybe people don't want number one. They all want number seven or number 13. And everybody wants seven. And everybody wants 13. Everybody wants 19. And then I sit there stuck with all the twos and the threes and the 48s and nobody wants them, right? That's one of the problems. So we actually had somebody go in and dive into um, our merchandise and so at 200,000 I would have to invest $150,000 to possibly profit another $50,000 to bring it to 400. And if I miss like that box that's sitting in that back room, I'm screwed. So that didn't make sense for us to do. The only next step for us on merch is to go more like a Portland Pickles and make a brand and target left-handed market and do that kind of thing. And that's not a hundred fifty thousand dollar investment to make fifty. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars in investment and marketing. You know, it's a huge risk, and the, the the reward is actually moderate. But us making that next little jump doesn't make sense to risk one hundred fifty thousand dollars to maybe make fifty. So there's that's that's kind of the merch game. Every market, as you go bigger or smaller, you just add zeros. It's all the same. And basically, kind of a neat thing, from 08 to 18, with the West Coast League and MLB, our numbers on market comparisons, even on value of teams, was literally the same increase as teams sold in our league as major leagues, just less zeros. So it's kind of neat to see those kind of studies over over 10 years. Um, And and it goes all the way down to like merch and beer sales and all those kind of things. So it's just, it's exactly the same, just less zeros behind it. So in 2020, uh, Major League Baseball took over minor league baseball, and what they did was they also shaved off what about 70 teams nation? Almost, almost half. Yeah, almost half of the minor league market's gone. Then doesn't mean they weren't successful markets. No, but that also now means that there's new opportunities with uh, collegiate summer wooden league baseball. There's also with independent baseball. Have you seen a growth opportunity just in that? 
Absolutely. So when that happened, and we had insight of it because we had owners um, within the um, the own major league teams, um, we had a discussion of like, how do we maintain or do we actually try to excel during this? But there's risk if we're going to excel. And the, the consensus was to excel. So that's why we went from 12 teams to 16 teams. And I wouldn't be surprised to see us at 24 teams and basically owning uh, Alberta, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho for all baseball. Um, that's, I think 24 is kind of the magic number. Um, but, you know, baseball is a league, the only legal monopoly in the United States, right? So when you've taken over an area like that, it's, it's, it's quite the statement in the game. It's a lot, and I'm glad that we have some really, really good owners at the table uh, moving, you know, to help us move forward with it. Yeah, for sure. Hayden has a question. Hayden, what's your question? Um, when you when you started or when you became the owner, what was the, I'd say, the biggest challenge you faced? Well, to, just to make sure to clarify, I came in as an owner and operator, right? So some, some people are owners, it's totally different. So I have a little bit different taste to the whole thing. Um, biggest challenge is not what you think it is. You think that you're going to go in and you have to prove yourself because you're the new owner and the whole town is looking at you and, you know, you, they, they don't care. They don't even care, you know. I mean, maybe a couple people care, but most people don't care. They, they want to see the product, you know. They want to see um, people out there um, and kind of what you're about. Um, you, when you're at any kind of sports team, you're part of a sports team, you're the glue. So I give this example all the time. If you and I are in Dallas Airport right now, and I see you wearing Mariner stuff and cracking stuff, or Seahawks stuff, I'm gonna say go Hawks, go in, right? Like we don't have to know each other. Do you have to? Even, do we even have to be from Seattle? But we're connected, right? Immediately. Now, if we were in Dallas and you're wearing a Port Angeles Lefty sweatshirt, okay, and I see you, we're talking. Or even, it's even, the smaller the market, the even more buying that you are. So that's what people are looking for, is what are you about, right? Portland Pickles, Edmonton, Victoria, those are big markets. So they're about community. They, got, they do a great job with community, but how they go about community is just going to be a different market than Port Angeles. And really a big different market from Victoria to Portland. They're just different environments. And so you have to kind of fit your, you got to in, you got to be in the right spot. Um, if I was the kind of person that liked wearing a suit, uh, and I wore that in Port Angeles, the team would not, would, wouldn't have that. Because if you wear a suit in Port Angeles, the, the highest per capita single business owner, sole business owners in Washington is on the Olympic Peninsula. So people own their own businesses, which means the CEO, even if it's a big company, has got car hearts on. Right? I knew I was in trouble. And people don't realize it was a former player. It was an old Mercedes, but I drove a Mercedes. I rolled in town, and everybody started talking. I immediately went to the car dealership and got a truck because that's what I was used to driving anyways. But I knew that if I keep dri kept driving a Mercedes in town, it was going to be an issue for me. So it, you know, it fit in for me really well because I didn't want to wear a suit every day. It worked in that market. I could get away with that stuff here. But if I was in Seattle, I showed up in Carhartts, people would be like, what's wrong with that guy? So you got to make sure you kind of fit in. So that's probably the most difficult thing. So pre-knowing you fit in and what you want to do fits with that community is a big deal. Ethan has a question. Ethan, do you think, because you said you did uh, you did baseball and football, so you've done a couple of sports. I, as a player. Yeah. Do you think being a player uh, for that sport and the other sports helps with your position now? I think that it... I think that people think the answer is yes, but it's probably no. It actually is probably a deterrent. Um, not for everybody. I'm not saying that because someone was an athlete that they shouldn't do it. But a lot of times when I have people that were like, oh, I used to play, they gravitate towards the players and that kind of mentality rather than um, the business part of it. Um, so I've had to have that conversation more often than not. Not saying, not all of them. Some of them come in and they understand the difference, but... I've had issues a lot of times with, with specifically baseball, former baseball players. I do like working with athletes, and there's lots of companies that like to work with athletes. So most of my employees were former athletes, but not necessarily baseball players. The magical Marcel. Marcel, what's your... Uh, you touched on you like 
started or being janitor in order to be an owner. Can you give like a piece of advice that you learned on your journey or like something that helped you grow to get to that point? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, goal setting, um, networking. I tell people all the time, I went to college for a long time. I was 400 something college credits. So I tell people I got a doctorate in networking, which means I went to all the clubs and got to know all the people and I enjoyed it. Um, that makes, that, that makes such a big, you know, who you know is a big deal, but who you are is actually a bigger deal because who you know, just because you show up at the same function of them doesn't mean that they are connected to you. So having that connection with people actually has been pivotal for the things that I do. And I do stuff beyond baseball. Like it's, uh, I help in, I do a lot of strategy stuff with, for, poli for politicians mm -hmm. and those kind of things. It's all networking. It's the same thing as like a lobbyist. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's getting to know people, knowing what they want, trying to get two things connected. Um, people would be amazed at some of the stuff that I do as a baseball owner. We had a big issue in town of, of uh, short-term rentals, small market. All these people are coming in to the town more than they've ever handled before. And I was talking to city council, texting, and then somebody that's in the crowd that I also know, trying to help them kind of meet a middle ground, and then how to can get this one other council person to kind of come to a middle ground. Like, people wouldn't realize that, but that's networking skills. So net networking was huge to get it. Setting the goals to know what you're looking for, what you want to be, what you want to do, um, and then knowing when to pivot, or is that pivoting just giving up? Or do I need to make a better plan in the first place? But knowing where you're going is kind of a big deal. Floating around and thinking you're going to hit it. I mean, lightning strikes sometimes, but odds are you aren't. You know, I'd rather have an idea of where I'm going to go. And then really ask myself if I'm pivoting, why am I pivoting? Am I giving up here? Did I not plan well enough? Or is this really truly things have changed and I need to go into this direction? But I couldn't have done any of it if I wasn't networked and connected to these people. And who I was, and they knew it. So that's, that's my answer. You get to know people. Malachi has a question. Malachi? Yeah, so when you first officially became an owner, mm -hmm. did any other really owners try to step up and mentor, or did they just kind of leave you to figure it out? Um, at that time, they had already put in a, a basically a, a new ownership or a new team program, um, and that has become extremely extensive now, uh, which is – so we basically have people assigned that are on different committees. So these two owners will help – this owner, these three or four general managers will assist this general manager. These people in food and bev will help from these other teams. So that it, you can't have just one team do it because it's overwhelming because you got to take care of your own stuff. But uh, we kind of divide and conquer. When the league first came into, you know, the league obviously started from the Pacific International League that started, what, 60, 75 years ago. And they just made a decision to have the semi-pro teams stay in the metro markets and the other places needed to do collegiate and so they decided to split it wasn't a big fight and then since then the, the smaller markets had success and some of the big markets like victoria and, and portland that had openings jumped in the league too rather than try to go with the you know more metro league and try to do fans so um yeah it's just that at the time it was just kind of like you know go get it done but now the program has gotten like more extensive every year. There's a lot of things that you have to do with our video stuff, all the tech things that we have going on. It's quite the list. So if we just turned it over to a group, even if they were pros at it, we have tech in our league that Major League doesn't have. We, we, we are testing things for Major League Baseball now. Um, we're actually designing what happens like in the Appalachian League and the, and the Draft League with MLB. So MLB asked our board to do that, and I was kind of going at first going, why are we the ones doing this for it? But if you think about it, those were old minor leagues, and those owners of those teams never sat at a board. They were always told by Major League Baseball, here's how you do it. This is what, how we want you to run it. And with MLB not telling minor league baseball, they own minor league baseball, but they're not those teams. They needed somebody to tell them what to do, or they were going to have to hire staff people to like cover all those things. So instead, we make the rules. We tell them the operating procedures. They take it to those two other leagues. So right now, there's only three collegiate summer league teams in the country connected to Major League Baseball. West Coast League, the Appalachian League, and the Draft League. There used to be a bunch of them that changed. So so from the hotbed of India, baseball is just like king, right? As uh, Saeed. So Saeed, what's your question? 
Um, so I was interested in how you mentioned you work with both politicians and athletes. Mm -hmm. I was just curious which of them were harder to deal with in terms of expectations. Oh, politicians, so let's stop writing this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just lobbied for $24 million for 11 stadiums in Washington to upgrade um, in our communities and got through uh, the Senate legislature and then on the governor's budget. And we're going through that process right now. But um, i tell you what, like, uh, it's, it's, we've had that for quite a while, and nobody's been able to tap into it yet. It's just paperwork after paperwork. And then you call the politician, like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then two pieces of paperwork go away, and three new ones come in that you have to fill out. It's tough. It's really difficult. Um, but, um, and, you know, I do have, we have a, we actually have a bunch of cricket players that come out to, and they come on Sundays and play. Um, and so they weren't they're necessarily baseball fans, but that's what started. I let them start going beyond the outfield fence and doing cricket out there because it's a big complex. They also play football on it. And so now on Sunday games, they actually show up. They don't show up for the first pitch, but they're about the fourth or fifth inning. So they come watch baseball for a little bit with the entire family, and then we just keep the park open for them to play cricket after. And we, you know, we've seen probably 40, 50 fans in that community. And some actually, we even got some games where people from Victoria have quite the cricket. They have a lot of cricket up there that will come over and play them on our field after our games on Sunday. So that's been like maybe 200 people that are coming over that we never would have gotten before if it didn't take a time to, you know, have that conversation. The cricket is a really good idea yeah. to draw the South Asian audience. They, that's they come over. super popular. Yeah. And the market is there. We have a small one, but Victoria has a large one. So mm -hmm. it's really nice to end the boat right away. Diego, what's your question? So I have two questions. The first one is like, what mistakes did you make that you want to make now when you're creating the baseball team in Port Angeles? And the second one is pretty vague, but I'm kind of interested. Like, what does a typical day in your life being the owner look like? Um, man, I made so many mistakes. It's, I can't. I couldn't even list them. I make them every day, um, but I don't make them again and again. Uh, I, 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 and I, and I don't let them pull me down. I just get back up. You know, I. If I screw something up, I'm just like, ah, don't do that again. Next, um, next pitch. Like that was something that I've always said to my teams that I, that I took. We can learn from the last pitch, but we can't go back. We can't do anything about it. So you pouting, you crying about it, you giving bad body language and bad vibes, like it does nothing good. So I apply that into my life every day. Um, you know, if I screw it up, don't do that again. And move on to the next thing, the thing I can control. Um, your second question was day in a life. Um, geez, man, just roll the dice. I mean, it's all over the map. Um, when it's, when it comes to the baseball team specifically, I had this conversation with my son who's 19, who's doing some stuff for me right now. I sell every, every moment I'm awake. Every moment I'm selling. Like, without question. Um, doesn't mean that I'm trying to sell you this car next to me, I'm selling in that connection with people. So different markets are different ways. So when you go to Seattle and you're in a business, the time is extremely valuable, right? So you want to go in and tell them this is exactly why you want something and why it's going to benefit you. And here's the ROI. Here's your time back. Thank you very much. If you're interested, holler at me. I'm out, right? When you're in a small market, you may talk with them five times before you get to that point. But that by the time you know them, you know, talk to them five times and have that kind of relationship, it's not like it's more like, I got an idea for you, man. And here's the here's what you're gonna get out of it. And you can send them a text message. It's a it's a much more social a much more social call. That makes sense. Um, and, and the funny thing is yesterday I bought some property, we're building we have an Airbnb on it and I'm building these little cabins in the woods. And I had a little bit of time, so I went out, took the chainsaw, and like got cleared out brush and stuff like that. There's a little practice field on a grange next to me. One of the guys comes through the bushes, and I, I knew him, you know, and a little bit, right? He's a plumber in town. He's like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, hey, I'm getting this brush out so you can find baseballs. You guys are always welcome to come over and get your baseballs from this little practice field. And we're talking, sitting on a, literally on a log, talking about our, our paraeducator strike going on and shooting the crap. And he said, you know, man, I trying to think of some ideas like I got these showers he goes I'm a plumber but I sell showers he goes and he, no one really knows that and I got this inventory and I'm like let's do a cash shower 
Like, like I, I, did, did I go into the woods yesterday thinking I was trying to sell this guy a, 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 an event at our game where we drop $1 bills with a fan into a shower, right? No. Um, it was him and I having a conversation and him feeling comfortable enough with me to say, people don't know I'm a plumber and I also sell showers, like high custom showers. And I was like, I can literally let everybody know you do it and they'll remember it. Right? And that was an easy one that came up. But I'm selling constantly. Like every day. Um, what I do during the day is going to adjust. And it changes the time of year. Uh, January, February, in the small market, it's more like I go to events. I go to the Humane, uh, Humane Society event, the Mutz and Yagaritas. It's awesome. You know, and um, go to the, you know, fundraisers for the high school and stuff like that. And then you get to the spring, I'm, I'm doing baseball stuff. Um, I go out to all the practices with the kids. I throw batting practice to them. Um, I'll pitch to them because a lot of times they can't throw strikes and their coaches need to coach. So I go out there and I'll be the one pitching. Um, that's that's marketing to me and that's connections with people. So it's not bad. I like it. I enjoy doing those things. But one thing I'd like to tell my son, I sell from when I wake up to the end of the day. In fact, if you have that mentality, not necessarily trying to take your business money, um, and in the small town, I got to see them at the supermarket. So I have to produce an ROI. I will turn down any advertising deals if there's not a, an ROI. If I can't see an ROI outside of institutional advertising, like Lakeside Industries, which is the ones that do like freeway stuff, that's institutional. If they want to drop $10,000 on the field sign, I'm good with it. There is no ROI for it. It's, it's institutional. But the little coffee shop, I'm not going to let them spend $10,000 because I can't prove we're going to help them sell $10,000 in coffee. And i got to see them, right? Matt, has got a question. Matt? Um, I know you talked about how you kind of have different groups that you'll collaborate with, but uh, I guess how do you balance and handle all the responsibilities owning and operating the team? Because it seems like you can get pulled in a lot of different directions. But... Well, first of all, Bree is my general manager, and she helps a, a tremendous amount, but I've done it by myself. That's just being organized, um, staying on top of things, uh, kind of knowing where you're at, especially when a lot of things are loose. But uh, binding things together is actually makes things a lot easier. Um, people ask me all the time, like, you own a restaurant, a bar, uh, these mobile bars, your baseball team, and all these other things, but they, they're actually all connected. Um, when I did the mobile bars, I was taking bartenders from other businesses, and that was an issue. Because, you know, they, they call me on a Saturday and then I lose my wedding bartender or my event bartender, right? So what I could do is I started my own cocktail bar. And so the best bartenders in the area want to work for me because they're, it's higher end, there's no fighting. And they also can go do the mobile stuff. And they also the group that comes and does the alcohol sales at the field, right? So most of those bartenders work for So it makes it way easier. And then you get someone new that's coming up that's cutting their teeth and learning some of that stuff. And all of a sudden they're part-time out there to make more money. It's like cleaning Airbnbs for me or, you know, they're doing other things so that they can make more money. The reality though is those, when I started putting those things together and pushing, having obviously good leadership with them too, it becomes less work because they understand. So I put every business thing together like I'm putting a team together. Um, I'm looking for the strong leader, uh, people that want to try to excel at the system, um, good communicators, and I'm also really good with them leading. Like, I think Bree is wonderful, but someday, her family's in Pittsburgh, she's going to go back to Pittsburgh, and I know that, you know, and I want that for her. What, I, what I'm asking is, let's find an assistant general manager out of one of these, can, out of one of these uh, interns down the road so you can train that person that can take over when that does happen. But having strong people in the right places makes it a lot better for me. Kayla, what's your question? Um, so I know you said, like, uh, Port Angeles is obviously, like, a smaller community, and, like, just kind of embedding yourself in the community is, like, helpful and, like, kind of building a sort of, like, brand loyalty. But what other marketing strategies do you use to connect your team to, like, the small community? Or would you say, like, you're utilizing a lot of like online kind of things like social media or is it more in-person based? It depends on what demographic we're trying to hit. Okay. So my primary demographic that I always want to hit the most 
profitable demographic out there is 34 to 54 year old women. So that is always gonna be my number one focus. They're the moms, they have disposable income, um, their husbands will show up. Uh, their husbands are gonna be not likely to be the ones getting in fights and being issues. Um, they're successful, they're bosses. So knowing that that's my number one demographic, everything after that is just depends on what you know we're doing. But even like uh, the hit pitch and run stuff we're doing with MLB, um, yeah, that's supposed to be marketed to kids, right? But what I'm making sure is the 34 to 50 year old women that are the moms of those kids, that they're aware. Because the reality is, if I'm marketing to the, the teenage kids, someone else is taking them, right? And someone else is definitely paying for them. And that's why I try to focus on that spot. So knowing it's really one demographic that's number one, two, and three, if we get to four and five, if we're trying to hit something specific, um, and sometimes we do, like uh, we do have the Coast Guard up there, nothing like military down here having went to high school here, but we have the Coast Guard there. It's such, it's a really small percentage, but we'll do stuff with the Coast Guards or retirees and those kind of things, and so we need to market to them. And actually, it's kind of fun uh, to, to break away from our normal marketing stuff. And then the kind of things, the 34 to 54 year old women living in different places in the state of Washington, and how they communicate is different. So, which is funny, in Port Angeles, it's still Facebook for them. Like we, it was kind of weird because I'd go in there and, you know, Snapchat and TikTok was just taking off when we first got there. They don't have that. The kids do, but they don't. If you want to talk to that group, it's 100% Facebook, which makes it really easy. Um, if I was there 10 years prior, I would have had to focus more on uh, radio and newspaper. Um, and they still have people, they sell a newspaper, a local newspaper, and uh, they have a local radio station still that covers but that the demographic that is is literally 65 plus, and I can go after them for like Sunday games, or if we do an earlier game, um, or, or in a certain market, uh, like Swim is next to us. Um, we have more season ticket holders from Swim than Port Angeles, like by far. It's like 75% of our season ticket holders, and that's because it's a retired community for the most part, a lot of Californians, so they're used to like some of the rush and they want to show up and know that that seat's their seat. And by, by God, we make sure that that is their seat because we've made that mistake before where, you know, that's, they want to know that seat six is theirs. You know, um, Port Angeles, they're used to walking up. They're not used to traffic at all. None of them came from, you know, Los Angeles and used to getting trapped in traffic and stuff. You know, it's five minutes to get across town, busiest or slowest time, it doesn't matter. So they, they will not pre-buy. Um, so it's, it's also learning those kind of things too and adapting. Um, we are going after more local season ticket holders. What we're going to do is we're putting a, kind of like a private club in the back of our um, team store, like with a false door and that, that kind of stuff and some uh, you know, like golf uh, simulator that they can do soccer or baseball and hit into like the screen and you know, put a little keg back there. Um, we thought that might be a way to increase, like, even Port Angeles season tickets. But And I like going off of our demographic and looking for those things. But for us, it's just the whole manpower. Everybody focuses in on that real quick. It's kind of a fun game. And then we go back to 34 to 54-year-old women, the bread and butter. Jocelyn, what's your question? Um, do you think if they didn't allow you to buy that 5% of the team, do you think that you still would have pursued being, like, an owner for a league, like working in baseball, or how different do you think your career was? Yeah, now? well, I actually owned the league myself. It was training, it was training, but it had become the, the minor league for the West Coast League. And um, so when I left coaching and I started doing the business stuff, like I, I wasn't sure, I was scared to death of business, honestly, because I went right out of college into coaching. I knew I was going to make a ton of money, but I knew it was one heck of a life. And I had a great time, traveled all over the place. Coached some amazing people, worked with some amazing people, and then I had these two little boys, and I wanted to be around. My wife was super successful, and I wasn't seeing them, and I was realizing some of the guys that were my age, as I moved up the ladder, were on the road 260, 280 days a year, and I didn't want to live that life. So I kind of started getting over like the the thing I was scared about business. I was I was just scared of the unknown, I guess. And once I got into it, it was like. Yeah, so I was going to be owning something and doing something. I was going to be creating something. 
um, without question. Um, I knew it was going to be in baseball, and I sure liked the training element. I just didn't like the seedy side of select training stuff. Um, I think that baseball is, become, is becoming a country club sport, and I didn't want baseball to become a country club sport. I want kids from all over the place having sandlots and playing and understanding the values that are taught to the game. When you, when you uh, make it so expensive to play, um, you lose a lot of kids, a lot of people. And you don't even know someone may develop between the time they're 11 years old and they're 17 years old, and we lose 90% of baseball players between 12 and 13 years old because the game becomes faster and some of those people don't develop as quick. So I didn't like – that was my problem with the training part. So I wanted to get more into the team and operation piece because I just didn't want to – charge people six hundred dollars to play in a baseball tournament when it really a hundred and seventy five bucks covered everything. Mm-hmm. So if you charge two hundred, you're good. It just felt like I was getting rid of a lot of those people. So in the game, yes. Business, yes. Um, it just kinda it, it, at least I had a direction. And then once the a team that I actually worked for was coming available, it was trying to be creative to work my way into it. And, and I actually operated for two years and the stuff in, in Lacey and made sure that things were good in Port Angeles before I basically shut that stuff down. But yeah, one time when I was first got to Port Angeles, I owned 11 teams at one time. Yeah, well, over half of them being training. Most of them being training kind of teams. But I also had the Kitsap Blue Jackets that stayed in the Pacific International League. The West Coast Guns stayed in the Pacific International League. But... Even myself, it doesn't sleep a whole bunch, and it's kind of high energy and going all the time. When I had 11 teams, there was things missed, and I was overwhelmed. It was a lot to take on. And, and I was missing some really easy things in Port Angeles to make up the difference. Hayden, what's your follow-up question? So even though the, the two different leagues, like the Kitsap, Blue Jackets League, and then the Puget Sound one got the rack, mm-hmm. how did it, going through those, how did that help set you up for success when it came to where you're at right now? Well, I mean, you can't get a hit if you don't swing, right? So I was swinging all over the place. So I, I was learning, I was failing at some things, and some things I was really good at. Make sure that we can repeat the things that are really good, and we learn from the failures. Again, now that you guys know that I set everything up like a team, um, it, that's pretty simple to share across the board to everybody. Um, so... Here's what we did well. Here's what we did wrong. Here's what we did in the developmental league that we can take into more of a spectator league, a participating league to the spectation. Like this little game or this little thing was really successful. Let's modify it in this way. And then how can we monetize it? And if we're going to monetize it, who could we promote with that? You know? So I just looked at some more swings. So, you t- so you've been talking a lot that comes into culture. When you're talking with somebody that's entering in as an intern, mm-hmm. how do you build that person up to whether they're working for you or not five years from now, that you build that culture to where they understand the expectations, but they also have gained a lot of knowledge? Yeah, so we uh, we invite, we, we have some of the best, I'm not just saying that we have some of the best interns because we, we pay our internship for since the beginning. Um, and the fact that I actually went to school to be a teacher uh, a special ed teacher, so I actually know do a pretty good job of making individual education pl- plans for each kid, especially before they come in. So we basically that's we put this really good system together. So I have former interns that are across every professional sport, um, and they're just killing it and absolutely love it. It's it's extremely competitive. Um, if you think about it, the players are trying to make it to the show. There's less positions in front management in the show than there is spots on the field. Okay? So it's that competitive. And I, I, that's probably one thing that I think that a lot of interns and stuff miss is they don't realize how competitive it is. It's like sometimes it's a cut your shoelaces and hide your glove and throw your bag over the fence kind of stuff. Like, and we, so we want to avoid that. What I do is, when we, and Bree is actually really good at it, we try to get interns that complement each other so as they, when they leave and they move up the system that they could actually help each other move up and they're going to have more force as they move forward. Um, and the prime example last year was Jarek was probably 
Uh, she just killed it. She was great. Um, I called one of my former interns who was at the University of Washington, the head of PR at University of Washington. She took her for another internship at the University of Washington. Jericho and I go through that national championship run year for the football team and then turns around and takes a job with the Giants. And then her dream job with the 49ers was offered right after. So she left the Giants and she's with the 49ers right now going into this next year. You don't think I'm not calling her for the next intern that comes up that is that's really special that fits in? I'm gonna call I'm gonna find what has the right fit that would compliment her, but I'm gonna call Jerica and be like, hey, now it's your turn. Okay. But also when on Rachel's case, Rachel she loves interns that come from me because she knows exactly what she's going to get. And she's one of my favorite examples because when I was back when I was coaching, the former owners didn't have, they had, they called them honeybees and it was not right. It was like, it was wrong. It was, it was, it was wrong. We were the blue jackets. They were the honeybees. They were not, there's no educational plan. There was no moving on. It was just like, I like baseball players and run around the field and do things. And it was, it was a mess. And so I talked to the, to the owners and said, hey, I really, I think you missed an opportunity here. And I also think that I know what you're doing here. You're trying to get Navy guys to come to a game, but this is not, this is not right. And so I went and found her at Washington State University. She did everything for three years in that park. She just did everything. So when she got her job with the Ravens, I asked her, what separated you from everybody else, all these other candidates? And she was like, they said ticketing. I was like, yeah, I can do that. And they said, marketing stuff? I can do that. She goes, I'll go hang your field signs. <laughs> I'll go do this. I'll go do that. And that's how she moved up the system. She had her ability to sell and her ability to do multiple things. What happens to a lot of people when they go into internships is you get there and they go, YouTube, tickets, YouTube, operations. And then they don't, they don't really know where you're at. And then you have to excel through it. And then sometimes people miss the little cue of, hey, can someone help us with tickets? I'll the ticket. People bitch about that all the time. So I'm going to say, not available. The reality is you should be like, yeah, I'm there. Um, whereas when they come with me, I kind of know what they want to do. I also know what they probably should be doing. And then after we, we work on that, I literally take them and put them in something totally different and make sure that they get that experience. And there's some things that we just do together, like all of us do. It sucks putting up field signs. We're all going to do it. And then as we're doing it, I'm explaining to them, you just walked on Olympic electric sign. Okay. I know him. He is a great person. He's donated a massive amount to this community. And you literally just walked on his sign. And then, oh, I didn't even think about that. As a matter of fact, let me call Derek. He's right around the corner. And then I, I pre pled it. I'm telling you right now, I pre set it up. I make sure that I, you know, it's somebody I know and that somebody's going to be close and they know what's going on. Because I know the first signs are going to come out. Someone's going to walk across them and not show the respect. And I'll literally call the owner of that sign up. So that's like one of my first lessons before the season starts. And he'll come out and go, yeah. And he'll give him this just testimony of like his whole life, all the things that are going on. They're like, man, I never want to step on that guy's sign again. Like they have a ton of respect for it and in just a different light. So those are just kind of some of the stuff that I do and some of the cues that I think that sometimes interns don't need to be told that are, that are there. Um, but it's highly competitive. But when the, the former president of the um, Santa Cruz uh, w, or NBA DL team, Jim mm -hmm. Wireman, used to talk about this, that you will learn more about mundane crap. Like you and I are sort of talking about insurance. Mm -hmm. Something that would not, how much mundane crap goes into your life that you would otherwise not know if you didn't own a team? I constantly am trying to get it out of my life and give it to Bree to do, but it still overflows. I mean, um, just the, the tech setup, um, where the Doppler radars are. We have unbelievable tech in the league. So we have TrackMan and Synergy. So TrackMan is a, a Doppler radar measuring everything going on the field, and Synergy is a multiple camera system. So that's all cool, and we get excited. But I have to figure out the degrees to put the cameras and the, the right pitch of the... And then we have to test it. So Breeze down there, actually, um, today, my son will throw baseballs, and she'll sit back there on a computer and click and make sure that the clicking at the right time, that everything is set up, everything is going right, the internet's working correctly, that the upload speed is good enough. That's pretty mundane stuff. Um, but the reality is, is we can't get the product we want when it's all said and done if, we, we can't, if we're not testing those things now. So 
There's a lot of that kind of stuff. But also not sitting in an office. Like, she's not sitting in an office. She's sitting in the press box. You know, my son's out helping her, and he's throwing baseballs and getting paid. Right? Like, so, not the worst thing in the world, but it's... For some people, yeah, it can get a little bit old. Um, I, I think it's actually... The industry is just literally overrun with ADD and ADHD people, and I'm one of them included. So people jump from thing to thing really quickly, and and but the ones that are really good are the ones that can do that, and then focus solely on that one thing, and then they jump on to the next thing. So that's keeping organized and having a goal and um, and taking care of the mundane stuff because you can't do it all at the last minute. It's literally impossible. Many things we can pick off in January and February when we're at our slowest, we pick off. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you.